Hello and welcome to Career Talk. I'm Lee Hopwood, CEO here at the CCMA and host of this very live show where I chat to some of the contact centre industry's most brilliant of people um, who have had fantastic career journeys so far. And why do I do this? Why do I have these great conversations? Well, apart from the fact that I love it, um, I also do it because I think that the people that I'm talking to are real inspirations for those that are working in the industry and those that might be thinking about having a career in the contact center world. And uh, and there, oh my goodness, I get asked, is there actually a career opportunity in, uh, in contact centers? And yes, there absolutely is. And joining me today as a fine example is Paul Manley, who is VP of Customer Service at DHL Express here in the UK. And I can't wait to chat with you, Paul. I know we've just been having a bit of a giggle off air, um, but you are the VP of a of customer service of a global household brand. I can't wait to find out how on earth you land. It's such a great job. But first, hello. Hello. Thank you very much for having me today, by the way. And yes, it, it was fun having a little giggle before we joined everybody else as well. And so I have to start. What does being VP of customer service <laughs> mean? What, what do you do every day? What are your responsibilities? Um, who, who do you spend time with? What does a typical day or week look like for you? Uh, so there's lots of questions there. Thank you. Um, there, there, well, I guess let me start at the end. There, there's no typical day, as I'm sure you can imagine. There genuinely isn't a typical day. Um, in, in terms of my responsibilities, well, my, my responsibilities are, are kind of two halves. One is because I'm a UK board member as well as um, running the customer service team. Uh, so, so, so both of those have different responsibilities. So if I start with my team, um it's genuinely about it we as a business focus on our people so the first responsibility i have is is 500 people so it's my job to make sure that uh, they are motivated engaged and they are developed as individuals and that's the first place that we start in any of our departments it's not just customer service that's how we try and run our business and then it's around, obviously, we're in a call, a contact center, a, 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 a customer services team. So, so we're focused on delivering for our customers. And again, my job is to make sure that everything that we do is geared towards that. Um, and then the, the, the third thing is making sure that we're doing that in an efficient way, the most efficient way that we can do, because we do want to make a benefit to our company's bottom line. So, so those, it's those three areas, really. In terms of my board responsibilities, um, obviously that means getting involved in the way the whole business is is going and what we're doing and what are the what are the things that we're looking for the future. It involves lots of reviews with other functions with other departments. Um, it involves roadshows, keeping people up to date. We do a lot of communications as a board, as a UK board. Uh, trying to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing as a business and where we're going. So, so I would say those two. And and, and I must admit, I, I spend I, I spend probably sixty percent of my time doing my customer service role, and about probably and I'm making these numbers up clearly, but forty percent of the time in, in the board environment. So, but there is definitely no typical day. I have to admit, absolutely not. And what I find interesting in in that is. So you are the voice of the customer, I assume, on yes. that around that board table, um, which is is fantastic. And for those that are thinking about, right, how do I get into the boardroom? How do I get there? And we'll talk about how you got there. But um, it's in uh, the bit that I find interesting and fascinating at that level is that it's it's not just customer service that you are. Um, uh, focused on that you're talking about you're the voice of the customer in that environment but actually you've also got to be across accounts finance you've got to be across what marketing you're doing you've got to be across what um, yeah. for you guys what the field are doing and and so your your knowledge and your experience is much more broader and expanded by being in that room absolutely and you know we'll get on to my career for sure uh, I've been in the UK, I've been in my current role, by the way, for three years, three years today, as it happens. Um, and, but I've been, with, I've been on the 
UK board for 12 years of my 18 years with DHL. Um, so I've been really lucky because I've got 12 years of experience of sitting in that boardroom, listening to the other functions, talking to the other functions. And, you know, it is genuinely it is something that builds up over time. You know, I'm much more confident about what's happening in the other functions now than I was 12 years ago. Um, so it is something that you learn and it is something that you have to develop um, and get involved. And I think that's the key thing is ask questions, get involved. If something doesn't sound right, then then ask questions and, and certainly challenge. And that's what another thing that we do in the boardroom is we challenge each other, just not because we're being critical. It's because we're all trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I love that. And, and and that ability to ask questions, especially especially when you're new in that boardroom, yeah. you think, oh, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I should ask this, put this question. It feels like a really stupid question. But actually, um, one of the things that I've always said is actually, if you've got that question, the chances are someone else in the room Correct. will have a very similar question. I, I, absolutely right. But you know what, saying that, as, as I said, I've been in there 12 years. I have heard some silly questions. I definitely have. I've heard, heard some brilliant um uh, questions too. I've also heard some really silly ideas and some brilliant ideas. Um, and interestingly, some of those silly ideas have done really well. So, so who knows at the end of the day? So yeah, I would encourage now, people to join up because we have substitutes go in sometimes and I would encourage all of them to get involved and ask questions for sure. Nice. Love that. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, you did a great degree. degree is <laughs> that was easy. Yes. <laughs> Just a few years ago, but you did a degree in economics. Why economics? Did you think, yeah, business is where I want to be? Did you know what your career was going to um, pan out to be? Why economics and what plans did you have? I think I'm going to give you a very disappointing answer to this one because I had no plans. I had no career planned out. I certainly didn't think, oh, I must work for a logistics company or, or anything like that. Um, but I also have to say, by the way, that university changed my life, absolutely changed my life. I come from Birmingham. I come from a poor area of, area of Birmingham. We had no money. I, I came up in a one parent. I'm looking for sympathy, by the way. No, it was a That's one parent okay. family. It was my father, which is, I guess, unusual that looked after us. Um, and, um, and going to university, um, completely changed my life. It was in the days when you actually got paid to go to university. I had a grant to go to university, didn't have tuition fees or student loans or anything like that. So it was the first time I'd ever had money, uh, which is uh, weird when you think about a student having money. Uh, but yeah. to answer your question, and I met so many different people, it was fantastic. It, was, it really changed my life in so many different ways, it gave me a lot of confidence, made me, introduced me to lots of different people. Um, but economics, to answer your question, Honestly, because it was pretty much the only thing that I was good at and I loved. Um, and Importantly, I, I, something you enjoyed. Exactly. And that's the point. I mean, I was actually good at other things, believe it or not. Um, but I actually loved doing economics. And, and I do think when you're doing a degree, and my kids have just gone to university, both of them now, which is almost depressing, but great in, in a way. Um, you know, I do think if you're going to study, certainly for me, if you're going to study the same thing for three years, albeit different angles on it, you really do need to love it. Because if you don't, you're going to struggle. And I loved it. I, 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 I loved it. I was, I'm good at maths, by the way. I like numbers. I like maths. There's lots of maths in, in, in economics. <clears throat> I've always been interested in politics and, and how the business world works as well. So it, it, it all fitted nicely together for me to do economics. And, and, you know, I did well and I enjoyed it and I got something out of it. But did I have a career path? No. Lots of people I was at university with, they, they went into being accountants or went into finance or whatever. Some of them knew that's what they wanted to do and some of them didn't. Um, but even when I came out, I didn't really have a clue what I was going to do. As it came out, it sounds like I was into prison. It wasn't like prison at all. It was a fantastic <laughs> experience. Well, I have to say, I had no idea that you you were um, into maths. I had no idea. But so what did you do? You came out of university. Where did you go? What did you do? Well, exactly. That's that's a, that's another strange thing as well, because um, and I guess it links back to at university. I met lots of different people and um, people who came from very diverse backgrounds and people who could actually influence things. I'd never met in my life. I'd never met people who could get you a job or, or, 
or influence your career before. It was just like, wow. Um, and at university, I met somebody who could do that or, who, or his family could do that. And this, this sounds a bit odd, but he, he suggested that he could, he got me a job teaching. He got me a job teaching English uh, in Eastbourne, in a, in a private school in Eastbourne. Um, and, um, and it was only for a short time and I loved it and it was fun, but it was never a career, by the way. And what, what I, all, all teachers, by the way, they read Times Educational Supplement, which is, well, it used to, it used to come out, I think, every Thursday or something. And I read this one day and I wanted to travel, is what I actually wanted to do. And in the Times Education Supplement, uh, there was a job for teaching English in Singapore. And I thought, well, that sounds quite interesting. So I did that. And I, I did that for a year. It was a, a year's contract. So after I, I was only in Eastbourne for a while, and then I went off to Singapore for a year to teach English. Um, and again, it was an amazing experience. And, and something, you know, going back to where I'd come from, it's like, you know, this, this poor kid from Birmingham who knows nothing about anything. All of a sudden, I mean, I'm in Singapore, uh, I'm earning a decent wage. I'm not getting taxed very much, by the way. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and, and it's a place, by the way, where they respect teachers. Um, and so I've got all this respect. I've got all this money. Uh, and, and I'm just having a great time. And I'm enjoying my job. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm enjoying it. I loved it. Why didn't you carry on with that? Because you say you were there for a year. And, and I know that you then um, got yourself a, a job at GE, which I'm can't wait to hear about your time at GE. But um, but why why did you therefore leave what you were doing if you loved it so much? I, I guess because it was it was never my aspiration to be a teacher. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I got a taste for having a decent income, and I I wanted to sustain that. Uh, and even back then, teachers were not well paid um, uh, in terms of their careers. And, and but to be honest with you, it was never something that uh, I, I saw myself doing long term. I have to say, and I think this is something that's true of most of the jobs that I've ever done. I have to say it taught me stuff that led me to the job that I'm at now. Um, when I'm teaching, it taught me, it gave me the confidence, it gave me the ability to stand up in front of a bunch of people and present or to talk and to have conversations like this, I guess. Um, and I got that very early on. It was my, it was pretty much my first job. And, you know, that, that, put you in good stead when you're going forward um, and the, you know the skills that you build up I honestly believe that the job I'm in now uh, is almost the fruition of all of those jobs put together more than my learnings put together brought me to this role um, to do what I'm doing today and, and how I'm doing it and, and teaching certainly certainly gave me the confidence to stand in front of people and you know it's one of the things that I love about my current job is standing up and sharing information with people. And I genuinely put that down to the roots of back in 1990. I've just given away my age, I guess, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm no spring chicken, but there you go. But, but what I, I guess what teaching, I've never thought of it before, but um, what teaching also gives you is you are getting the satisfaction of seeing people progress, people Correct. learn. You're, um, you're in a um, position where you are able to help people learn, which arguably when, when you're in management, albeit yes, in, in customer service, but when you're in management, that's what you're doing. You're, you're helping uh, people progress. Absolutely. And again, you know, going back to, you know, it all got me here. You're right. It was my first experience of seeing the benefits of helping people and developing people. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. So you left teaching in Singapore. You came <laughs> back to the UK, um, back did. to our sunny climate. And so I was you... in lovely. That's why. Oh, that's why that's you came what back. That's happens. <laughs> yeah, you, that might be a theme. To be, to be honest. <laughs> there's a story there's an underlying yeah. story here so you came back to GE what was your first G job at GE and um, I mean it's a major organization and I guess yeah. it is where you cut your teeth in corporate world but what was that first job so my first job was so GE is a huge multinational uh, conglomerate actually had lots of businesses and mm. I worked for an insurance company I worked in the claims department 
and I was assessing claims. Now, just to put it in perspective, I came back to the UK, having left the UK uh, in the late 80s when it was booming, I came back in the recession and it was like, great, good timing, good timing, Paul. So I thought, I'll just get a job that will tide me over until I get a proper graduate job. Um, but again, and this is another theme of my roles, I loved it. I genuinely loved it. Um, it was a job where we, it was where we analyzed people's insurance claims. It was for people who were off sick or redundant and they had monthly payments for something. So we used to, we used to analyze them to see whether they met the claims criteria or not. And to be honest, uh, I'm not proud of this bit. Our job really was to make, to see, to check that they were valid because if they weren't we didn't pay the claim if they were we paid the claim and and i and again i looked around me at that time and this was i guess that's a kind of a contact center by the way you know i was going to say is that yeah were you talking to customers or was yeah. or was that a back no, office function? i was talk no i was talking to customers about because obviously um people who've been made redundant to carry on getting paid, they had to show that they were looking for work. So I was yeah. calling customers, finding out, how are you looking for work? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. But I looked around me and I saw people who were better than others. I saw people who were worse than others. And, you know, the worst offenders were those where they were actually rude to people. They were maybe patronizing to people or something like that. And again, I, I, I genuinely remember, I remember my first ever call, which petrified the heck out of me, by the way. But I also genuinely remember thinking, actually, if I'm antagonistic with a customer, the conversation doesn't go where I want it to go. If I'm polite and clear with customers, actually, even if I don't give that customer what they want, then it goes a lot better than, than the opposite. So even back then, as I said before, I was preparing myself for this role. Um, because, and, that, and those are some of the things I learned. And again, um, you know, it was a department of about 150 and over that, the, I was there for about four or five years uh, in, in that claims department, but I gradually uh, moved up the ranks. So again, it allowed me to start managing people, which was my first experience of managing people. Um, and then I started managing managers um, and again, that was that was a great experience because, as we all know, that's different to, to managing um, frontline advisors. To actually manage managers is different. Um, so again, it gave me that experience. And without jumping ahead to your next question, which I don't know what that is, by the way, but um, actually, I was really lucky. That's another theme of my career. I've been really lucky and been in the right place at the right time is G actually in the mid 90s, 94, 95, had two insurance companies in the UK doing the same thing. One which is where we were, which is in Richmond in Surrey, and one in Enfield, North London. And they decided the mer to merge the two together. Um, and um, I was part of the team. There were only two of us from the claims team in Richmond and two of them from the, from the other um, company. We worked together on merging the companies. But the point here is that the guy that was running the whole merger project had been shipped over from the States um, to run the merger project. He had just come from a role that he managed a team of people in the States where they moved around the United States into different companies trying to do process improvements. So he was here, I was in this team, he and I got on really well. He liked my contributions and he turned around to me and said, how do you fancy going to the States for a year, another year, going to the States, doing this job, travel around, you know, try and get best practice share and process improvement share. And it was like, hang on, now that's not really a tough question, is it? Are you really serious? And, you know, I spent the next year literally on an all expenses trip to the States. I lived in Atlanta for six months. I lived in Connecticut, which is where most of GE's head offices are. Um, and, um, and I learned so much about process improvement. And at the same time, GE was introducing something called Six Sigma. And now I don't know if you've ever heard of Six Sigma, but if you have, it's because GE popularized it. Motorola started it, GE popularized it. And they rolled it out in 1995 when I was there. 
So I was at the forefront because I was in this team doing process improvement. So I was at the forefront of that. And um, and then when I came back to the UK, it started rolling out in the UK. So I was ahead of everybody else in the UK. And that's when um, and they have these. It's it's quite it was quite embarrassing at the time calling myself. I was actually called a master black belt. Um, well, that's what your LinkedIn profile says, and you right. I was going to ask you Yeah, you've you been that. stalking me, haven't you? Lee? I have. <laughs> I have to check you out first. Uh, but you, yeah. it says on your LinkedIn profile that you were a master black belt for four years. What? No, what were that. you doing? Well, well, first of all, it's it's the most embarrassing title job title I've ever had. I mean, <laughs> my, it just Karate, sounds. Karate, judo. Yeah, I, yeah. So anyway, Master Black Belt, it, it, basically Six Sigma uh, is a way of improving a process. It's a, pro, it's a, a process to improve processes, actually. Um, and the more educated you get, the more experienced you get, you go up from, they have Yellow Belt, Green Belt, Black Belt, Master Black Belt. And Master Black Belt is the top. And I was, eventually I became a Master Black Belt. When I came back to the UK, as I said, they were rolling out in the UK. So I was literally faced with four or five GE businesses that, that were recruiting at the same time. And it was fantastic timing. Um, and, you know, all of them wanted me because I'd been doing it for a year in the States. And so I was ahead and it was, it was amazing. So I actually chose, and again, another learning, I actually chose a company in Manchester um, a GE company in Manchester, and the reason I chose it was because the guy that was would be my boss was amazing. He was intelligent, he was inspirational, he was motivational, and that's why I chose that job. And that again was another message for me to to say actually, people choose people; they genuinely do to work for. And the opposite is also true that if you're working for somebody, you don't get on with or you don't like you have more opportunities to leave because they they come up um because you force it um but people like working for people that they they inspired they're inspired by they're motivated by and they feel like they get on with and they they get something out and that was another lesson for me as well as all the lessons about how to do process improvement you know it was all about actually this guy's an inspiration a guy called stephen bird no idea what happened to him by the way but inspirational in my career for sure so, so um so it you were at ge for eight years and you you did leave for a little while and then come back it, it was that around about the time that you left um, and why did you leave if you actually came back because you actually had quite a long overall you had quite a long career at ge i did have yeah i, I actually went back you're right so i left it's another theme that we've touched i left because I was in love and I got married and my wife lived, well, we had a house in Cobham in Surrey and the job, because this guy was, the inspirational guy was in Manchester. And to be frank, I did that commute for a long time, by the way, uh, Monday to Friday, uh, but it wasn't sustainable. It just wasn't. And, and I, yeah, I had to leave. <laughs> What's interesting is, and I laugh now because this was so long ago, um, I'm not very good at relationships, Lee. So it didn't last very long. Um, so my wife, for some reason, and I, I, I know you may struggle to believe this, but she decided that she didn't actually love me. So I, I know, and it was terribly sad. It genuinely was, but I did yeah. go back to GE. I went back up to Manchester and moved lock, stock and barrel up there at the time before I met my current wife, by the way. So all's well that ends well. Uh, oh, but, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, I, and I, I can't believe that um, someone would leave you, Paul. But well, actually, she's lovely. She did it for the right reasons. Let me just get that out there, by the way. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad to hear that you're happily married now. But but actually going through a divorce when you're working and in actually, um, you know, a, a management role, that's actually um, that will resonate with people that are going through, whether it's divorce, whether it's yeah. um, a, a major stressful um time in their private lives how did you deal with that at the time in terms of balancing that um I mean, going through a divorce it just takes over your your, your head yeah, absolutely. Um, but how do you manage that in terms of your work life balance and what did you what impact did it have on work I, I, absolutely the most difficult time of my life genuinely the most difficult time of my life 
um, apart from maybe when my mother left when I was a kid, but park that one because that's a whole different story. Um, oh, yeah, that's another, that's another <laughs> yeah, we don't want to go there. But I genuinely, um, it was because of work that I got through um, because work was my safe place. Work was a place where um, I knew that people cared. I knew that people supported me. Um, and it also took my mind out off what was happening. I could actually get involved in something uh, that actually took my mind off something that, as you say, just dominates your, your whole thinking um, uh, if you let it. And yeah. for work, for me, work was a fantastic release from that and a fantastic way to get through that time. And even today, genuinely, I use it as an example here to say, I want to create an environment here. I want the environment to be where people feel supported, where people feel like they can come here and it be better than the alternative, like staying off work and and being depressed or, or whatever. I want people to feel supported. I want people to feel like we're here to help you be the best person that you can be. Um, and we're here to support you through anything. And we've had marriages, divorces, we've had all sorts of upsets here, even in my time. Uh, and I genuinely believe that it, the environment you create here makes a difference to how well people cope with that, but also how well they merge work and life at the same time. Um, and, and that, again, was an experience that I went through that, that certainly changed my view of the benefits of work. It isn't just a place to come and earn some money and take home. It's a place where you can get so much more. And that's one of the things that you can definitely get out of work. Sure, I love that. I've never heard someone articulate it like that before, but I, you, you're right. There is that um, work-life balance, life-work balance um, that, that some say. And But actually there is a balance because yes, you can get so much out of, out of work. So you were at GE for a long, long time. Um, learning lots as you go. Why did you leave there, um, albeit that you went yeah. to DHL, and I know you love it at DHL, but what, why did you leave GE for DHL? Okay, so, um, so GE, as I said, has lots of companies. I, were, I ended up in a company that does vehicle leasing, um, not, not cars, but vans and trucks. And I was in, actually, I was in a both a process improvement role and then an operational role. I actually ended up running the south of England's uh, service centers, depots. Um, and so I had a number of service centers and um, we turned that business around. It was a loss making business. Um, another inspirational leader called Andrew Way was a brilliant guy. Um, he helped us turn that around. He was a CEO. He, we turned that business around to make money from a loss making situation. Um, and I genuinely thought that GE would sell that business once it started to make a profit. That's what GE did. It was very acquisitive, but it also got rid of um, problems. And this was had been a problem. We turned it around and it started making money. And I genuinely thought, uh, G was going to sell it. So I had a choice at that point. I either stay in a company and get sold and end up in the vehicle leasing business, which is really not where I wanted to be, or I moved GE business. Uh, and I kind of thought, well, if I stay, if I move to another GE business, I'm probably here for the rest of my life. I probably yeah. am. I've been there a long time. I'm probably, this is possibly an opportunity for me to go and look elsewhere. So I did look elsewhere um, and I, I knew I wanted to, to go to another corporate. I, I, I fit the mold. It, G had been fantastic for me um, and, um, and I'd done well. And I wanted to go to another corporate and a, a name that I recognize and DHL came up. As I said, I was in an operational role at the time, owning some uh, service centers or depots. And the role at DHL was was very similar. It was running, it was a completely different industry, obviously, uh, but it was running some service centers. And so that's what I did. Now, just to finish off that story, G never solved that business, by the way. <laughs> so I was completely wrong. Um, but uh, but I was also very fortunate that I found a company that I love just as much as, uh, if not more, actually, than GE. <laughs> 
when you were looking um, for your next role, did you have other roles in the mix? Uh, was DHL the only one? And, or did you have other roles in the mix that maybe you went for and didn't get? No, DHL was the only one in the yeah, mix, no. to be honest with you. Um, and I, mainly because I wasn't really in a rush. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, applying for lots of different roles because I didn't need to. I, yeah. you know, when I said that GE was about to sell it, you know, I knew I probably had a year, two years. Well, yeah. Clearly, I was wrong anyway. Um, but uh, so I wasn't in a rush. So, so I was, and I did genuinely. I had this criteria that I wanted a company that I recognised that 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 it was corporate, that was all of these good things. And for me, the role was a much easier transition because it was a very, very similar role to the one mm. I'd just been doing. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was literally within a year of me being at DHL, and I said that um, GE popularized Six Sigma, within a year of joining DHL, guess what? DHL introduced Six Sigma. So again, I mean, I I've been incredibly lucky, honestly. Again, I was the obvious choice to, 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 to do that job because I'd had by this point, whatever it was, eight, nine years of experience in and out of operational roles and process improvement roles. So when DHL decided to do, we call it first choice, we didn't call it uh, Six Sigma. Um, but when DHL decided to do first choice, I, I was the obvious choice and I was almost a shoe in to that role. And, and it was just like, wow, OK, I'll do that for sure. That's something I love doing. So that's well, I guess kind of you've 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 grabbed opportunities as they've as they've sure. come to you, um, which has obviously given you skills um, that are beyond maybe you were planning. Um, but you've now been at DHL for eighteen years, um, which is phenomenal. And I don't you know, look old enough, do I? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> um, but how? I mean, you're you're clearly dedicated to them. I know that you absolutely love working at DHL. You love your job. How has your career developed during that time? And, and maybe you can um, talk about some of the key projects that you've done during that time as well. Sure. So, um, so as I said, within a year, I, I got into this first choice role. Um, at the time, it was one person, it was me. I was in a team of people that did projects, uh, but I was the first choice person. Um, if I if I suddenly jump to the end, by the way, which was three years ago, by within that, and I'll come back and fill the gaps in for you. But by the time I finished, it was a board role job, wow. and um, I had about forty people on various different things working for me. Whether that was reporting, I had health and safety, I had all sorts of things in there as well. So, um, so. Well, I guess leaning into what you said earlier, um, you've been there eighteen years. You've been on the board for twelve years. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I can see where actually that those first six years led into it becoming a board role. Yes, and and again, I was I was just really lucky. Um, so I I started doing projects. Obviously, first choice we call them projects. Um, some of them some of them were successful. Some of them weren't. But 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 we we did a great job, and and gradually we built up um, the the credibility of of what we were doing and my team grew we bolted on we bolted on a reporting team we bolted on as i said health and safety and audit and and our um we have a, a, a culture changing process called cis certified international specialist and that came into me as well um and um during this period the ceo before the one that we've got now a guy called Phil Kuchman, um, he loved what I was doing. And he literally, I was in HR at the time. This function had moved to HR, I know, randomly. And he took it out of that and he made it report into himself. And then after a couple more years of that, he put me on the UK board. And and and, and, I, and it was just those kind of things. So, so in terms of projects, I've done some amazing projects here. Um, as I said, we, I was responsible for the cultural change program here in the UK. It's a global thing, our certified international specialist. But it's essentially, um, if you think about an induction program, it's an induction program 
but it's also a program that um, tells our managers, helps our managers understand how do we want them to manage their people? Because we are a very people focused business. We want them to manage them in particular ways. We want them to give feedback. We want them to develop and coach their people. So we have a series of, of, of modules that help them do that. And I was so lucky to be part of that almost from its inception here in the UK and, and building that up. So that's one of the things I'm probably most proud of. Um, and then I also, I um, the one that actually made a massive difference to my life again was the one I did near the end of my time in, in continuous improvement. My whole team changed the title to continuous improvement, by the way. Um, over one of those years, I have no idea which year, um, was we have most of our customer service team is here in East Midlands. I'm in East Midlands today. Um, and we opened a new site in Reading. Um, and that was my project. So I opened that site. I helped create that site. I helped create the team. I helped create the culture down there. And to be frank, that gave me the, the bug, the CS bug. Um, and, and, and again, I was lucky because once I'd been through that, the opportunity to do my current role came up. And if I l just backtrack a little bit, in that 12 years on the UK board, um, I've seen people come into my job and leave my job uh, over the years, obviously, as I have most of the other functions, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't know if you've ever done it, but I, I quite often sat in the boardroom and I was thinking, why would you do that? And, and I've challenged them and we've had conversations and I'm thinking, I wouldn't do it like that. I'd do this. I wouldn't do that or I'd do this or that's a really good idea. That really translates to this department. So again, I've had I've had all those years of seeing what's worked, not just in CS, but in all the other functions. I've had all the time to learn what's working and what doesn't work in in, in so many different ways that when it came to when it came to this opportunity, it was like, you know, there actually comes a point where you have to stop thinking, I reckon I could do it better and actually put your hat in the ring. And, start and doing that's what it I did. Yourself. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I did. And and by the way, and, and again, it is a theme. I loved it. I've loved every single job I've ever done, but I loved my continuous improvement role. Um, you know, I'd built it up. It was almost my baby because I'd create, well, my boss obviously made it, but I created it into a board level job. And, you know, it was difficult let, letting go of that. But it was also exciting to, to look at another role and saying, actually, I can see where we can take this. I can see what we can do differently. I can see what's working and what's not working. And I was again really. For, I don't have, apart from, you know, the things that we've talked about. I don't have a contact center background. I don't come from customer service. You may not remember remember this, Lee, but when I first started, I called you, and uh, and I and I said to you, I, I'm not I'm not a contact center. You know, I need to be in a a something like the CCMA to actually learn from other people what they're doing, and that's for me what the CCMA is great for, by the way. Um, you know, it gives me the ability to talk to other people, speak to other people, but also learn from, mainly learn from other people. Um, and, you know, I was really lucky that my boss said, yeah, Paul, go and do that. I mean, how lucky am I? Most people who have done this job before have some kind of contact center background. I, I don't, apart from actually, talking through my my cv with you i guess actually maybe i have you do by the yeah. sounds of things you yeah, do exactly um, and, so he and took it's a risk, basically i think to be honest well um you say that um for him he probably didn't because you as you have said yourself you know the business inside out and and that whole continuous improvement piece customer service is continually improving uh, and, absolutely and, whether it's because of the tech, whether it's because of the um, macro um, factors that are influencing us, or just the fact that customers keep changing, um, customer demand keeps changing. So actually, you've, you've got the right skills and you started on the phones. 
um, to, to be in a, a leading role in contact centres. But one of the things that is really, really clear, and actually I think this is something that um, is a skill that puts you front and centre in that role, is that you are um, what many would describe as a people person. And as a, as a leader, let alone a leader in a um, customer contact environment, but as a leader, um, evidence suggests that being a people person is one of those um, key attributes. Why, why do you think that that's important? Why do you think that being a people person is important at such a senior level? It's simply because people are the most important thing. And we genuinely, it isn't just me, we as a business genuinely believe that everything starts with our people. And by the way, it isn't about giving people everything they want. It, it's, about, it's about making sure that they are the best person they can be. And that will be about coaching, training, developing them, but also if they're in the wrong job, letting them know they're in the wrong job or helping them find a job that's appropriate. And, and I think that's why it's important to focus on people because a lot of what I've done, and we've been really successful here, I have to say, in the last three years, um, a lot of what I've done is simply putting the right people in the right jobs, things that suit them, developing them into those jobs for sure, but actually then letting them get on and do their jobs. And by doing that, it makes my job a lot easier and they get a lot out of it. So for me, you can't think about meeting customer requirements if you're not meeting your employee requirements. If you're not putting the right people in the right job with the right skill set at the right time, then you won't be able to meet the customer requirements. So for me, it genuinely is about putting our people first, making sure that they're coming in, they're motivated and they're trained to do the right thing and they've got the right skill set to do the right thing. If they do that, then they'll do the best that they can. They'll do the best that they can. And that's what you want. And then the customers will notice that. And if you can do that, then you've hit you've hit gold. And, and I, I love that. And, and I guess coupled with that, you've also got um, some of the things that I know that you, you believe in, the honesty, the transparency. Um, and like you say, if, if someone is in a job that is better suited to them, then they will be more successful and therefore quite yeah. probably more happy. Yes, more happy? absolutely. Happier. And And by the way, that doesn't mean that you don't take people out of their comfort zone and you, you do put them, but, but you do it in a in a safer environment. You support them and you help them into that because that's also important for their development as well. But yes, I, I think I think honesty is 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 definitely and I, I mean honesty with your employees and your customers, by the way. Um, I mean, you know, my views, are, I, I, you know, I wouldn't ever use uh, AI technology with a customer when he doesn't know or she doesn't know that they're talking to a bot. You know, we are completely open with our customers. We're completely open with our employers. Or I like to think we are completely open with our employers. And I, and I genuinely, I try and say hi to every single new person we have, every single induction, I go in and speak to them. And one of the things I say is, look, our focus is you. It is about developing you, motivating you and training you, but we don't always get it right. So talk to us, tell us, and we'll do what we can. We can't fix everything. I can't fix everything. I like to think I can but I can't. Um, but but if we if we at least have that conversation, then we've got a chance of doing it. Uh, and I think that's really important. And that's also what builds trust at all levels of the of the organization. And, you know, touch wood. You know, I think we've been quite successful at doing that recently, which is great news. Paul, well, thank you so much. You, you've that everything you've talked about, you've littered with advice and tips and experiences that I know those that are listening are going to be um, really grateful for. Um, thank you so much. And I could literally sit here and chat with you for quite a few hours yet. But I always finish with some um, what I love to think are rapid fire questions. And I always fail miserably at making them quick. Um, okay. But he goes, so no pressure ready? on me then. Yeah, no <laughs> pressure. No pressure on you, all the pressure's on me. Uh, right, so, given DHL, red or yellow? Oh, stop. That's like asking me to choose between my children. Red. 
<laughs> tea or coffee? Well, I can't stand tea, and I've been off coffee for 30 years, so I... What do you I, drink instead? I'm caffeine... Water. I'm caffeine free. <laughs> um, uh, a little story. Have I got time for a little story? A little you can story. Do a little my story, first go wife, through. my first wife, who decided she didn't love me. I, I I used to drink coffee very very strong, black coffee, and I used to drink a lot of it. And I started getting really bad headaches, really yes. bad headaches. And uh, she said, "It's the coffee." I said, "It's not the coffee. Don't be silly, Pamela. It's not the coffee." And she said, "Paul, it's the coffee." So I said, look, to prove to you it's not the coffee, I will stop drinking coffee. Well, headaches just went, literally. So I haven't, but it must be, yeah, 30 odd years um, without coffee since. I, had the, I do have the occasional decaf coffee, but not very often. Do you know what I was going to say? What happens if someone says, let's go for a coffee, meet you in Starbucks? Yeah, decaf. Decaf, that's, yeah. that's the occasion. So um, one final question for you, Paul. What do you do in your free time? You are so dedicated to DHL. What do you do to switch off from DHL? What do you do in your free time? So, um, again, not a short answer, I'm afraid. But, well, first of all, I run. I run I run five or six times a week. And wow. for exactly that reason, I switch off. Well, not exactly that reason. It does help me to switch off. Also, because I like to feel like I'm healthy. Um, but it helps me switch off because I promise you all I can think about when I'm running is how do I get this leg in front of that one? I can't think of anything else. Um, but the, the slightly longer story, if I may, is that I have, I have two children, uh, both at university now, one in the second year, one in the first year, which means for the past 21 years, I have been rushing around doing football matches, cricket. My daughter loves cricket and football, by the way, as well as my son. Football, cricket, refereeing, drinking, their mates around. I, my, my life has been obsessed with my children because I, I, I think my children are fantastic. Um, but then I'm, I'm sure everybody does. Slightly biased, um, but that's okay. Yes, slightly biased. <laughs> now, I find myself, uh, my wife and I find ourselves in a very strange situation in September when my daughter went to university that all of a sudden they've gone and the house is empty and not only that our weekends are actually free so we've had a complete flip from being what we used to say is time poor to actually at the weekends at least we've got time so I, I, honestly since september we've done some fantastic we've been into we go into london theaters quite a lot we go we go to the movies we meet friends we're having we're having a great we were in malta last week we're having a great time um I love so that. Um, but this weekend, we're off to Bristol to see my little boy. Next week, I say little boy, he's 21. My, my, <laughs> next week, we're off to Leeds to see my daughter. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're having a great time. Oh, and you deserve it. I think um, absolutely lovely. take thank full you. advantage of your free weekends. I'm looking forward to that myself. Paul, thank you so much for sharing your, your life story, your career with us um, today. Really, really appreciate you giving us your time. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And hey, um, thank you for listening. Career Talk I do on a fairly regular basis. There are more episodes that you can watch where I've in in interviewed some of the most amazing people, just like Paul. Um, so please do feel free to go to our website, c2may.org.uk, and check those out. For now, have a great rest of your day.